Hi there. Well, with last week us having had to cancel Wednesday because I was not uh, capable of lecturing, we that was a really super short lecture video that I made for you guys. Well, super short compared to our normal class period. Um, we're going to be a little bit behind. We might also have suffered a little bit of distraction on during Wednesday's class. So I wanted to make sure that you guys got this content, and this is the only way that I can do it at this point. We're going to talk about operant conditioning, uh, specifically reinforcement and punishment, in this video that I'm going to give you today. Now, operant conditioning, we have Thorndike's law of effect. Now, Thorndike hypothesized that consequences of a behavior strengthen or weaken a behavior. And he suggested that if something followed a behavior, that was comfortable and nice, that behavior was more likely to be replicated. Well, B.F. Skinner picked up that um, theory and he kind of ran with it and he really started to apply it to the area of experimentation and he worked primarily with animals but he was really able to look at how um, species learned and he really believed that the learning mechanisms were the same for all species and he also believed that behavior was controlled by those environmental forces or those things that would strengthen um, reinforce or punish a behavior so BF created this uh, interesting little experimental paradigm where he would take uh, pigeons, rats, mice, and he would place them in this box and he could pretty much train these little entities to do certain things. He could train a pigeon to peck a specific spot on a wall. He could train the little uh, mouse or rat that we have here to reach up, place its little front paws on that lever and actually depress the lever. And the series of uh, reinforcement schedules would actually get that rat to complete that final behavior. Now, the series of reinforcement schedules is a process called shaping. It's where we reward approximations of the desired behavior. And one of the best applications that I have for this in my life is having potty trained my daughters. One of the first things that we did is we got them to just, you know, practice sitting on the toilet and then, you know, every time they would be in the bathroom and let's say they would go to the bathroom, maybe even still in their diaper, we would reinforce that behavior, eventually getting them to sit down on the toilet and eliminate and then eventually have them actually use the toilet themselves. But we shape behavior everywhere. Anytime uh, an employer works with an employee to get them trained up on a program or a simulation. And we even reward approximations of the desired behavior in our class, where on each subsequent assignments, we give you more and more feedback to hopefully improve you for the next assignment. We want to reward you for getting closer to those max points possible. Now, reinforcement is um, the idea of when something is going to increase a behavior. And the things that increase behavior are nice things, a rewarding stimulus. Now, <clears throat> I told you at the beginning of the semester that I was going to need you to forget about some things. And believe it or not, I need you to forget about what you think of when you think of the word positive. Um, I asked you to forget first what positive meant when we talked about correlations. And now I'm asking you to do it again, because when we talk about positive reinforcement, it's going to be anything that increases the likelihood of behavior. So it could be a rewarding stimulus that is added to the environment. Now, it's very, very important, and this is my biggest caveat when we talk about operant conditioning, is that when we talk about something being a rewarding stimulus, this is very person-specific. For example, um, I love pedicures. I love pedicures. I think that they are wonderful. I use them to motivate me very frequently, not only professionally, but also personally. And um, so when I accomplish a goal or complete a task or reach a certain level of proficiency, I treat myself to a pedicure. My husband, on the other hand, thinks that pedicures are probably the seventh level of hell. I mean, he would much rather get a root canal than a pedicure to have anybody touch his feet. So a pedicure for me would be a reward stimulus. For him, it would be an adverse stimulus. It would be a negative thing. He would not want that. So remember that when we talk about reinforcement, what's rewarding is something that increases the likelihood of behavior. Negative reinforcement behavior is followed also by a rewarding consequence, but the rewarding consequence is that something that we didn't like is taken away. So when you see positive, think added. When you see negative, think removed. Okay, positive reinforcement. You work really hard on a unit quiz and you get a great grade, right? That is something that has been added to your environment. Negative reinforcement would be you do really, really well on a unit quiz and you get off of probation by your parents for having bad grades. That would be something that was negative or adverse has been removed. 
Um, positive reinforcement, you get a bonus for a certain number of sales. Positive reinforcement, you get a attaboy or a kudos from your professor for not missing any days, so you get additional points. Uh, negative reinforcement would be, let's say, everybody shows up to class one day and I decide that everybody gets 10 points because the classroom is full. Um, something adverse, the stress of points was being removed or eliminated. Now, we have different schedules of reinforcement, different ways that we look at the frequency of reinforcement, and it's either based upon time or behavior. Our first sort of turquoise line is called fixed ratio. The reinforcement follows a set number of behaviors. So for every five attempts on a quiz, you get 10 points. That would be uh, following a set number of behaviors. Variable ratio, the reinforcement follows an unpredictable number of behaviors. If you'll notice the purple line, you receive reinforcement somewhere between 5 and 15 times you take a quiz. That would be an unpredictable number of behaviors. Fixed interval, the reinforcement follows a behavior that occurs after a set amount of time has elapsed. So every five minutes you'd receive the reinforcement or the positive stimulus. And then variable interval, the reinforcement follows a behavior that occurs after an unpredictable amount of time has elapsed. So what we have here is we have um, two different concepts. We have fixed, which means set, and we have ratio, which means number of behaviors. Um, variable is unpredictable and interval is time. If you look at the way those words come together, let's say on an assessment you see um, Janie gets paid for every 30 tiles she lays while she is working on tiling somebody's bathroom. Okay, if you think about it, what we're talking about is a number of behaviors. So every 30 tiles that she lays down. And if it's a set number, right, 30 tiles, that's going to be a fixed ratio. Fixed interval would be a set amount of time. So that's what you would get paid like an hourly wage. Can you imagine how much you'd want to go to work if maybe you'd get paid somewhere, you know, between, um, you know, 60 minutes and 85 minutes. You might get paid somewhere in between that. That variable interval is not very reinforcing. It's not a very strong builder. The best schedule of reinforcement, though, by far is what we call a continuous. Continuous means that every single time something happens, you get the reward. Every single time you do something right, every single time something happens, you are reinforced and you get that reward every single time. That continuous schedule of reinforcement is most effective, especially when you're training kids and animals. I'm sure that's uh, no surprise. Now the other part of operant conditioning, uh, we have reinforcement, is punishment. Now punishment is something that's going to decrease a behavior. Remember, just like what we find to be a rewarding stimulus, what we find to be an unpleasant stimulus is going to be person dependent as well. Positive punishment, behavior is followed by an adverse consequence. Positive punishment means that a behavior is followed by an adverse consequence. The easiest example that I have is when somebody gets a spanking or you get a speeding ticket. You participate in the behavior, it's followed by something that is not nice that is added to your environment. A negative punishment is when the follow is also followed by an adverse consequence, but in this example, something that we really want, something that's rewarding, is actually removed. Um, academic probation, that's a negative punishment. Your academic freedoms have been removed when you are on academic probation. Now, I can run through a few more examples, but I'd rather have you uh, walk through some more of these with me, and we'll just kind of differentiate with what we see here. Your father gives you a credit card at the end of your first year in college because you did so well. As a result, your grade continue, grades continue to get better in your second year. <clears throat> so what you want to do is you want to ask yourself, is something added or removed? Answer that question. Now ask yourself, is a behavior increasing or decreasing? Answer it. So you can see that something's been added to the environment, right? They're getting a credit card and the behavior is increasing. They do even better their second year. That's going to be positive reinforcement. When you ask yourself added or removed, you define that first word. It's either going to be positive or negative. Okay? <clears throat> reinforcement means the behavior is increasing. All right? So ask yourself those two questions anytime we come to a uh, reinforcement or punishment question. A lion in a circus learns how to stand up on a chair and jump through a hoop to receive a food treat. Okay, ask yourself, 
Is something being added or removed? Is the behavior increasing or decreasing? Again, positive reinforcement. Because that food is being added to the environment and the lion jumping through the hoop increases, right? Next one, a professor has a policy of exempting students from the final exam if they maintain perfect attendance during the quarter. His student's attendance increases dramatically. So ask yourself, is something being added or removed? And is a behavior increasing or decreasing? Getting a little tricky now. Is something being added or removed? Something's being removed, and that's a negative reinforcer. So we remove the adverse stimulus, right? We remove the thing that we don't want, which is the final exam, which is not going to happen in this class. Uh, we remove that thing that we don't want, and then we see that the behavior is increasing because attendance is also increasing. Let's do one more. You check the coin return slot on a t pay telephone and you find a quarter. You find yourself checking other telephones over the next few days. Ask yourself, is something being added or removed? And then, is a behavior increasing or decreasing? Positive reinforcement is by far one of the easiest examples that we can come up with because they're so commonplace in our society. Uh, here's another one. Your hands are cold, so you put your gloves on, warming them up. In the future, you are more likely to put gloves on when it is cold. Ask yourself, is something being added or removed, and is a behavior increasing or decreasing? These get a little bit tricky because here we see that it's negative reinforcement. Something that we didn't like, which is being cold, was being removed. So that's going to increase the likelihood of behavior. So putting on the gloves, removing the coldness or the negative uh, sensation from our hands will um, increase the likelihood of us wearing gloves in the future. All right. Mana, mana. Manamana. Manamana. <laughs> these things, these videos are just so fun to make all by yourself sitting in your office. Um, you have another participation. You had two assigned today on Wednesday. You have until 11.59 on Thursday to get it completed. And don't forget that you have your unit quiz and it'll be active Thursday at 11 a.m. and it'll be due Friday night by 11.59 p.m. Um, I think that's it. I just wanted to make sure that you got this information. Uh, I want to wrap up with just a few comments about punishment. As a parent, one of the things that um, we see a lot in the philosophy and the data that's out there today is that one of the things that you don't want to do is you don't want to focus on punishment being the way in which you work with your kids in their environment. Here's a, just three points that we know that are pretty concrete throughout um, the research on punishment now. Punished behavior is suppressed, it's not forgotten, which means that an individual, if that behavior is punished, they're still likely to participate in that behavior if no other intervention is provided. That's one of the reasons why we see such a high recidivism rate for people who are institutionalized, because theoretically when they're punished, the idea is that they're not going to want to have that consequence again, but the problem is, is that behavior is still there. If we don't work on educating, treating, and dealing with the issues at the core of illegal behavior, then we're really not going to fix that behavior because that behavior is just suppressed. It's still there. Punishment can teach fear. Uh, one of the things that we see, especially in working with younger kids and animals, is the, you know, the cowering or the flinching, especially if it's physical punishment. We don't want to, as leaders, we don't want to be the be feared, we want to be revered and respected. And uh, one of the ways to do that is to avoid a focus on punishment. Physical punishment may increase aggression by modeling aggression as a way to cope with problems. One of the things that we're seeing pretty clearly is that kids who are spanked, um, spanked, you know, very consistently and maybe even excessively are more likely to be individuals to use physical violence as they age into adolescence and even into adulthood because they, it's, what's modeled for them is that when a parent is afraid or an individual is concerned or upset about something, the most effective route for dealing with that is to get physical with somebody. So just those three points, be sure to think about that. Um, one of the